Good evening and welcome to the IC Academics and the webinar. Believe you are all keeping absolutely fine. On this fine evening, I may like to say that we conducted 2021 ICA annual conference at Delhi on 17, 18, and 19 last Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The conference was an excellent conference. A lot of people participated. Even, even the planned as hybrid, it ended up as physical conference. And good interaction were there. And the Society for Ambulatory Anesthesia, as well as for the American Society of Anesthesiologists, see Samba and ASA, both participate with their deliberations. On the world, I may say, this is one of the best conferences ICA was able to deliver to you all. Now, coming to the webinar. Today's webinar, the topic, as I circulated to you all, well, something which is known to all of us, but need fine tuning. This is regarding the cardiopulmonary research station, which now Indian Research Council, where we are all a part, is trying to redefine as well as reskill everyone. Dr. Chakarao, which is Galaxy of Speakers, Mughal, Ragesh, Say, Rahab. Um, Paul, Jiki Divetia, Beljit, and Rasesh Divan are going to present to you certain minimal things what one should know in India with the maximal skill utilized in its application. And I request Chakra to open the topic and introduce each one of the speakers and go ahead with the program. And once again, I say thank you for bringing this to ICA platform, even though a bit late, we are not able to take it earlier. Chakra, please start. Uh, sir, I will take over. Uh, I'm Mukul Kapoor. I'm taking over, sir. And uh, I will introduce Dr. Chakra Rao. Dr. Chakra Rao is the chairman of the Indian Resuscitation Council Federation. And uh, Dr. Chakra Rao has been in the forefront of resuscitation training in our country and especially ever since the uh, Indian Resuscitation Council was formed, he has been uh, uh, most dynamic, he has worked day and night, he has got us all involved in it and people have started calling him the father of resuscitation in India exactly. and uh, he has been recognized by not only uh, the ISA, he has been recognized by the Indian Medical Association also and uh, he is receiving an award from Indian Medical uh, Association called as the uh, AKN Sina uh, Award for his contributions uh, to the cause of resuscitation in India. Uh, sir uh, is an anesthesiologist, of course, and uh, he's a retired. Uh, he's retired as the additional director general of uh, medical services from Andhra Pradesh. And apart from that, he has been the president of uh, the ISA. He has been the secretary of ISA and is also a very important member of the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiology, WFSA. Uh, I would now request Dr. Chakra Rao to please uh, introduce the concept of Indian Resuscitation Council Federation. Thank you very much, sir. I just wanted to share my screen. Uh, this is actually... Actually, the Indian uh, thank you for giving me a, an opportunity from the Indian Society, in, Indian College of Anesthesiologists, for which I am also a, a founder member. And uh, uh, the issue here is actually the Indian Society of Anesthesiologists has asked me to bring out the Indian guidelines for resuscitation because there are about, uh, as per one of the survey, less than 2% of the Indians know about CPR and about 4,280 people per 1 lakh population are succumbed to the 
cardiac arrest because there is no attempt of any cpr on them so that is the reason so the indian society as anesthesiologist has come forward so we had a meeting of the uh, some of the great people this is our uh, make in india prime minister uh, so this is also our guidelines are make in india guidelines and uh, now we have come so we made the indian resuscitation council and uh, these are so this is the thing uh, there is a survey by uh, in uh, 2016 that only less than 2% of the people are trained in cardiopulmonary resuscitation so that is the reason why there is no resuscitation and people are dying these are all preventable deaths so indian society of anesthesiologists has come forward so these are all the great people that have assembled you can see the galaxy of people um, in the standing and uh, sitting with me uh, these are all the people the first meeting that was held in hyderabad and these are the people from them who have chosen the the 10 members the, no, these are all actually working um, the 10 members are very prime members including these ladies and all those things so we, they have formed the indian resuscitation guidelines so now then i have labeled it as a indian resuscitation council and we are going as a journey passes 2018 the ilkar has come into the forefront and they have formed the world restart a hard day they have asked us to do some cpr for the world restart a hard day they have uh, um actually on october 16 they called it as a world restart a hard day which is uh, um coming on the same day like uh, world ncc day so but that year actually because of some of the issues like uh, um dasra and all we have postponed to october 23rd and then so in the first year itself we did trainings for about 2.25 lakh school children and lay persons so that has become a good hit and that year we could not attend the meeting of the ilkar uh, dr lokesh hedra who is actually supporting us from us as uh, he uh, went there and attended and 2019 we have attended me rakesh and another lokesh uh, tiwari pediatrician have attended the meeting and have participated how they are making the guidelines in aha it is act- actually exactly the it is not the aha that make the guidelines it is the elcar that make the guidelines and and the guidelines are definitely they are not 100% uh, um um they are not 100% uh, um actually very scientific sometimes they are consensus they have taken sometimes they are easily part um, um, easily practicable things they have taken and the whole idea is to promote the cpr into people but the unfortunate thing is uh, the most populous countries like uh, china and india were not in ilkar ilkar the only seven countries are representing Um, 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 are the members of elcar and in that uh, uh, only a lobby of countries are there and we are not there in that so now we have come across and venay natkarne is a, one of the persons who is the next uh, chair of the aha and elcar so he has uh, he whenever he is coming to india he is sending me a word and we are all going and meeting him we met thrice he is always advising us uh, why don't to join elka we wanted to join but he says that uh, only anesthetists have written these guidelines so we want i t- i told them only, i told him only only anesthetists are interested here other people are not very much interested because they want cardiologists cardiologists are always in the cath lab and he wants 
emergency medicine physician. The emergency physicians are not born at, in India and even probably in 2022, the departments will be established in all the medical colleges. Now we have about 548 medical colleges till date. So in, in those medical colleges, only few medical colleges has got but but even then, they are insisting us to go with the emergency medical physicians, critical care people, and uh, pediatricians, and everything, uh, cardiologists. So for a membership in LCAR, actually, we have now registered ourselves as uh, Indian Resuscitation Council Federation. This is registered under the uh, Companies Act of 8, 2013, and it has got, now we are getting all the concessions like 10A and uh, 80G and all those things. So uh, now it is a, almost an independent body, but IRC is existing. IRC is always IRC, but IRCF is for the practical purposes of joining the ILCAR. So there is a uh, not much of a difference between IRC and IRCF. If only for account purposes, we are making this everything. Now we have a bank account. We have our own PAN number. We have DIN number. Everything is going on. Now the uh, IRCF is established. Now in the bargain, actually, we have also invited. Actually, ICA is already there in IRC. IRC. Uh, they are um, actually they have given us a letter that uh, they wanted to work with us in uh, in Indian Resuscitation Council. Uh, now <clears throat> we have asked the Indian Medical Association to be with us because the Indian Medical Association is a very big body, and uh, they have participated. The pre their president has participated with us in two three meetings when we are with. Uh, talking with uh, the Ilkar and uh, Venen Hatkarni. So they have developed a very much interest because of the, we wanted to do CPR and this 4,280 um, per 1 lakh population per year are almost preventable deaths. And if we can practice CPR, at least 50% of the people we can save. So that is the concept. And on this, we have built up. Now we are... Uh, uh, in Andhra Pradesh, actually, uh, the, the first uh, medical university, the NTR University of Medical Sciences, has made it compulsory to undergo BCLS because, because when we are writing the um, um, guidelines, we have changed the nomenclature so that there will not be any problem of copyright issues with AHA. So, what they are termed as BLS, we have made it as BCLS. What they have termed as uh, ACLS, we have termed it as CCLS. And we have created one more um, <clears throat> a program that is for the school children and the um, lay people. That is, we called it as COLS. Now the COLS is very popular and COLS is synonymous with uh, actually Rakesh Garg and uh, Syed Mohit, not only synonymous with uh, CYLS is India and India is CYLS, even the Elkar people are calling it as CYLS and calls. And it is nothing but the bystander um, CPR. And now we have done it in a very big way and we did it. In 2019, actually we have trained about four lakhs 7,036 people, and this has also a becoming a, a big hit. In 2020, because there is a big COVID problem, we have invited all of them, all the members of the ILCAR, and uh, called them to a, a meeting online, and we have released the, the first day cover and the, a stamp on the CPR. So that was a big hit. Uh, the ministers and everybody has also attended on that. So, 
So it is going on like that. Now, even now, actually, we thought uh, with the formation of the um, IRCF and with uh, different guidelines as suggested by them, we will be having a membership in Elkar, but we could not produce it in the due time, October. Uh, we did a, and we need a sponsorship for the membership also. That sponsorship also we have applied. Probably in the next six months, we will be make, becoming the members of Elkar. So from the beginning, we are doing something, something, and we are making an attempt. And uh, with the AP Medical University making it mandatory for all the house surgeons, we are uh, doing uh, trainings. We have trained 15 members in each medical college to train the others. So that is going on. And our other aim is to reduce the, make it very cost effective. These trainings, when we are doing it for 5,000 and 8,000, I felt and we all felt that it is very expensive and it should be available, very, very cost effective. So we made it only 500 rupees for BCLS and 900 rupees for CCLS. So this is going on well. And uh, in the meanwhile, we have tried with the uh, National Medical Council and they have introduced uh, uh, the, uh, as a, uh, the CPR as a foundational course after uh, in the first month of joining the medicine. And we have, we are also giving them all the necessary um, PowerPoints and everything. It is going on. In the meanwhile, we are also, we have also tried with the CBSC um, board and the CBSC board is now made it, uh, uh, they have taken our CPR uh, into the curriculum of the ninth class and probably as the schools open, definitely we, we wanted to train all the school teachers and thereby the, all the students and probably we wanted to achieve every, um, every citizen a lifesaver and we wanted to decrease the preventable deaths because of the cardiac arrest. This is our aim. Now IMA has been involved. IMA has formed one um, um, a committee. For that also, they made me the chairman. And now I am preparing an uh, action plan for the next five years, how we have to make every citizen a lifesaver. And another slogan we have is, your two hands can save the life. So these two hands, when you are outside, with outside the hospital, definitely these two hands only will help to, to compress the chest and that will save the lives. Uh, next, I'll go to, I'll make a short clips of two, one or two, and I will hand it over to the next speaker. And this is a small video I just wanted to show you. This is actually the scenario of a CPR or CYLS. When you see someone collapse to the ground, ensure that the scene is safe. Tap on the both shoulders with both hands and ask loudly, hello, are you all right? And check for normal breathing. If there is no purposeful verbal response or movement or no breathing, call for help. Activate the local emergency medical system and ambulance. Then, Start chest compressions. Keep the heel of one hand on the center of chest. Two fingers above the lower end of breast bone. Place the other hand over it, interlocking the fingers. Keep the elbow straight, shoulder above the chest. Push hard, five to six centimeters downwards. At a rate of 120 per minute. Allow the chest to recoil after each compression. Count loudly one, two, three, up to 30. After each five such cycles of 30 chest compressions, check for response by moving, coughing or verbalizing and for breathing. Do not interrupt chest compressions unnecessarily. Continue compressions till the victim becomes responsive or help arrives. Do not hesitate. Your actions could save a life. 
This is the small video. Actually, I told you this is the, from the first time it was happened in October, details. October twenty third. I just wanted to keep it. www.caprindia.in. This is actually this uh, was made by the uh, Sashidharan, so he made it as a Kerala chapter, and uh, no problem. So <clears throat> I told you now this four thousand two hundred and eighty people per one lakh population per year are succumbed to cardiac arrest. And if you calculate, it will be 112 persons per minute. So every minute we are, our people are getting cardiac arrest, 112 people are getting cardiac arrest. So I tell you, most of these cardiac arrests occur outside the hospital and 90% they occur at home. And out of that, 90% are going to die if you do not attempt a CPR. And the survival rate will be, if it is delayed, the chances of survival will be decreasing by 7 to 10%. Everybody says it is golden hour. Here it is not the golden hour. It is, the way I counted as golden minutes. And I told you as 50% of the people can be saved if you do, a, if you attempt CPR immediately. And the results can be doubled or even can be tripled if it is done immediately. So this is the thing I wanted to tell. And I just wanted to tell you this. I wanted to skip this and go for a small video, a natural uh, occurrences and all those things where it is uh, written. And in the, I will tell you the difference between a, a sudden cardiac arrest and an heart attack. And this is actually a video taken from the permission from the Joe. Sudden cardiac arrest occurs when the heart stops beating properly. Sudden cardiac arrest is an electrical problem caused by an abnormality in the heart's electrical system. The heart's pumping action is disruptive and the heart can't pump blood to the brain, lungs, and other organs. Seconds later, the victim collapses suddenly, appears lifeless, and is not breathing or is abnormally gasping for air. You may see several seconds of seizure-like symptoms. Mm, not true. Cardiac arrest can happen to anyone, anywhere, anytime. Although more commonly seen in those who have heart disease, cardiac arrest can also strike those with no history of heart problems at all and can be caused by recreational drug use, electrocution, or even a sudden blow to the chest. Sudden cardiac arrest is the leading cause of death in many countries, and its survival rate is less than 1% worldwide. No, cardiac arrest is not the same as a heart attack. Think of a heart attack as a plumbing problem. It occurs when blood flow to the heart is blocked. Victims of a heart attack are still conscious and may complain about symptoms such as shortness of breath or discomfort in the chest. In contrast, cardiac arrest victims need help right away. Every minute without help means the chances of survival drops by seven to 10%. That leaves only a golden survival window of only two. Uh, this is actually a, uh, that what has happened Shall I come down? What has happened in uh, Hyderabad? Uh, you concentrate on the cases. What has happened? Everybody, they are happily playing, and nobody knows uh, to do a CPR or do anything. See, observe this uh, bowler. He never expected that he will die, and uh, none of the people know about CPR and he has succumbed to death. Now, this has really happened in Hyderabad. And I will show you, this is a scenario caught in the CCTV, a doctor making rounds, and she has developed cardiac arrest and succumbed to death because even in the hospital, many people do not know about CPR. And I tell you, CPR is never, it is not in the curriculum of MBBS or even your post-graduation or anywhere. It is sometimes taught by your seniors and professors, but in many of the times, in many of the, most of the 400, 400, 542 medical colleges or 48 medical colleges, even one 
mankin is not available and this is the scenario See, he has uh, succumbed to death, and this is a scenario in the bank. I just wanted to fast forward. Uh, he also came to the bank, and uh, uh, he has uh, developed cardiac arrest. and uh, nobody knows so what we have to tell not only teaching we have to impress on the government that a person should be in every every organization there should be somebody who knows cpr so even even when the people if this is the flight of our uh, past president actually what has happened to this, this is his last speech in sri lanka now we are uh, we are making it as a cpr day uh, to to remember is a and today number theory i brought out and uh, at that time there some zombi zombi and namaskar mudaya to ban which he said to be the destiny of the nation that an indian ground recite an acknowledgement from our past so he has succumbed like that because we we do not know and we do not uh, uh, practice we do not teach cpr these are the things that are happening so what we want is we want every citizen yes yes you need actually bring your law or guidelines or circular we met uh, um, our uh, vice president twice to release our uh, manuals our working manuals the bcls manuals and ccls manuals he only released and uh, probably probably you know, it is almost confirmed we are meeting him on 7th again at hyderabad and probably what he has told uh, i i request him to issue uh, or send a, a, a dev letter to the concerned um, ministers to implement so what he tells is the cpr training is compulsory in all schools we need to import this training to all personnel in public sector and private companies we need to build an india where every citizen is capable of saving others in times of life threatening distress i am very happy that the director general of police andhra pradesh is here because police presence is there everywhere in every taluk in every road in even highway so if police men are trained they can take care of others and they can do it in a more effective manner and secondary even the home guards also can be important i think i have taken more time i just wanted to complete this and uh, this is the inauguration of the bcls book by him and uh, this is we met the um, uh, nabh chairman to apprise about uh, these uh, indian guidelines he has accepted so now we are uh, giving training for the nabh also and uh, i tell you it is the 16th of october the world restart a hard day but every day let us train every people every day and make every citizen a life saver thank you very much and thank you sir thanks for giving this opportunity thank you very much sir thank you chakra sir yes sir. yeah i just share my screen sir yes sir i think i have taken a little more time but <clears throat> uh so we now move move ahead and we will give you some presentations uh i'll first i'll talk about the what was the need for our irc and what was the need for our guidelines sorry so when we talk about cpr 
the world started recognizing that uh, mortality and morbidity was associated with sudden cardiac arrest and this mortality and morbidity can be mitigated uh, as uh, in case we had some proper way of resuscitating people so it was in 1960 that cpr was started by first the american heart association as a program and finally the aha issued the first cpr guidelines in 1966 subsequently what happened was other countries started developing their own cpr programs as per the local requirements of their country the ilcor that is the international liaison committee on resuscitation was finally formed in 1992 which was basically to form a liaison between principal resuscitation organizations across the world and we released our first guidelines the indian guidelines in 2017 so what is the need for cpr guidelines we have to remember this fact that anyone can learn cpr and everyone should learn cpr and that is the reason why we need some guidelines which are universally applicable it is said that in united kingdom only 23% of people know how to administer cpr that means even in a developed country like the united kingdom 77% of people do not know about how one should con- uh, conduct resuscitation in india undoubtedly the situation is much worse cpr algorithms are thus required a simple practice guidelines for teaching laymen and paramedics that is the basic purpose of an algorithm unfortunately before the indian resuscitation guidelines came in and in then uh, resuscitation code that is irc introduced these guidelines there were no widely accepted cpr practice guidelines in our country as dr chakra rao said earlier only 2% of people are aware of cpr as per the last survey done in 2016 so to know more about how much people are aware we have just started a survey in which we will be asking this question to people have you heard about cardiopulmonary resuscitation and in case the person answers yes it is very good in case the person does not answer it as yes we are going to teach that person in the survey how to do cpr we have to make this is the uh, an effort by the irc which is going to start in the next month and which is being supported by some pharma companies and also ima so what is the status of cpr training in our country most of the cpr training which is going on in the country has been designed and is meant for the western world and all these things are contained in a single voluminous document which is very detailed in nature it needs periodic long periods of training needs periodic recertification and it also depends a lot on the use of expensive resuscitation and training equipment as a result of this whatever cpr tra- is uh, ha- training is happening in the country it is not easily communicable to the common population of india because of language and educational barriers secondly those guidelines recommend as a primary thing aids that is automated defibrillator devices for the use by laymen unfortunately even our educated person even the medical personnel do not have easy access to aids so again we need a change because of this then early transfer of victims to hospitals is not easily feasible in our country because we do not have that kind of infrastructure apart from this there were or issues of copyright and revenue barriers that means very expensive guidelines and revenue barriers were there and it was unaffordable to teach the layman in the streets apart from this we have got some special barriers in our country one of the barriers is high rate of illiteracy we have got poorly developed emergency service systems and ambulance services it is for the first time that our country has now started emergency departments in all hospitals we didn't even have emergency departments in most hospitals medical colleges also didn't have properly developed emergency departments now we are developing it now and because of all this cpr as recommended by the aho algorithms is not easily accessible to all we have also got certain cultural beliefs in which majority of the people are hesitant to address uh, anybody who's had a uh, cardiac arrest or to perform mouth to mouth resuscitation secondly teaching these skills is difficult and these skills because these skills are difficult to acquire and in case they are not used appropriately 
it may cause more harm to the person rather than do good to the person. Coming to the status of CPR training in our uh, in our country in hospitals, Dr. Uh, Chakra Rao just said that we have approached NIBH and they are ready to support us. Yes, they are ready to support us because what is happening is hospitals, even corporate, corporate hospitals cannot afford to train the staff with the international guidelines and certification at the hospital expense. They're phenomenally expensive. So as a result, some hospitals run their own locally framed courses and or they force this look, their own staff to pay large amounts of fee for certification and recertification. Unfortunately, uh, the NABH requires that everybody, uh, it's not, I shouldn't say unfortunately, I would say that this NABH requires every staff to be well-trained in cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And once a poor nurse has to undergo such a training or a poor GD has to undergo such a training in a hospital and pay almost a month's salary to get the train, it is not feasible economically for them. The hospitals as a result run locally made such courses and these locally made courses are highly deficient. They are sketchy in nature. They're not well organized. And generally they run as per whims and fancies of the local instructors. There's no proper defined algorithm to run it. This training is thus highly dissociated and is not well structured. And the problem is further compounded by the fact that the value of this certificate outside the hospital is zero. Nobody outside that particular hospital, uh, hospital accepts this certification. And especially for nurses who need to go abroad after this, this certificate is of no value in case it is a local red certificate. In case you want to spread the message of CPR or resuscitation across the country, you need to teach school children. And this, this was first recognized in Norway in 1961, that if you start teaching school children, the chances of patients or victims getting resuscitation in areas where no hospital access is there is much better. So they started teaching school children in 1961. And it was recognized by the European Resuscitation Council in 1992 and fi finally, what happened was all European schools in 1992 included basic life support in their curriculum. As Dr. Chakrarao said, finally, we have been able to achieve it with the help of the IRC and the persuasion of a few of our members. Now, CPR is in CBSE textbooks and in class nine textbooks. And our algorithm, the IRC algorithm is what is shown, the image is shown I and mean, whatever is written is from the IRC algorithms. So what is the advantage of the Indian guidelines? In the Indian guidelines are cost effective, very reasonably priced. They're within the reach of all people. And we have plans and we have already started doing that. We have started uh, teaching uh, centers, CRTCs have been made in many medical colleges and we plan to do it in all medical and dental colleges across the country. We want to have CRTCs in all states and districts. We want to reach out all universities that because we have more than 120,000 nursing students passing out every year, more than 60,000 MBBS students passing out every year, and more than 30,000 dental students passing out every year. We want all of them to be trained in the Indian guidelines. One very senior anesthesiologist asked me a few months earlier, what he said, why does a senior anesthesiologist need to learn CPR for, and need a recertification for CPR? He says anesthesiologists are very competent in managing the airway. And why can't they do it without these guidelines or without any training? The simple answer is CPR saves lives. And CPR is a life saving skill that everyone should learn. If protocols and algorithms are followed, then the outcomes are much better. So that is the reason why we need to learn. We need to learn protocols and algorithms. This paper was published just two days back. And this paper was published in Open Access Emergency Medicine. And the, you can see the title of the paper says, why do not physicians attend hospital CPR training? So this is a big problem in hospitals. Physicians don't want to attend uh, this training. So the one of the questions were asked was, cardiac arrest occurs so infrequently that CPR training is not necessary. Whether, and they were asked to say whether they agreed, disagreed or anything. So most people, even internal medicine people, most of them, uh, large population of them were not sure whether they 
uh, CPR ex exists uh, frequently, and that is the reason. Infrequently, and that is the reason why they do not want to turn uh, learn about it. The second question asked was: I have sufficient CPR skills training, and that's why I do not uh, feel the necessity of attending a CPR program. Look at the how how high the percentage is. Agreed by it, twenty percent. Twenty percent of doctors felt that they did not need CPR training. So that is the current status of this thing. And others were confused. And very small number, like ten percent, felt that actually everybody should learn CPR. So this is the state of affairs across the world, not just India. This is the state of affairs across the world that people do not want to learn CPR. And how can they further train the population in CPR? I don't know. Then second question which that person asked was. What is the requirement of relearning CPR? Why, when I've learned it once, what is the requirement? Research has very clearly shown that there is very poor retention of CPR skills unless it is retaught regularly. Because even intelligent and well motivated people who learn CPR tend to forget it within a year in case they have not performed CPR. So retention of CPR skills is said to be very low even at six months. CPR is thus a skill which must be regularly practiced, and it is thus wise to repeat the course every two years to maintain your skills. And recertification also has the advantage that it helps you learn new advances and discoveries which have happened in after you have trained the last day. The management principle which explains this is called as the Dunning-Kruger effect. The Dunning-Kruger effect says that when somebody learns something, the person feels very confident and thinks that he has reached the peak of competence. And this in management uh, parlance is called as Mr. Stupid. He thinks he's uh, very intelligent, but he's actually Mr. Stupid. But what happens over some time is he tends to forget all this. And in case he's given enlightenment again, that means he's again taught again this thing, he rises from this valley of despair to a plateau of sustainability and thus carries forward the message and becomes an expert at whatever he's doing. So this is what we want to achieve also by regularly training people in CPR. Thank you very much. I would now request Dr. Rakesh Gar to tell us about the COLS algorithm. Sorry, the four links of CPR. Thank you so much, sir. So uh, after this initial, why do we want to have uh, CRTC, I'll take you towards uh, the core link of uh, the uh, resuscitation. These core links are part of the published articles which has been published in Indian Journal of Anesthesia, wherein we have algorithms and subsequent uh, speakers will be talking on them. But when we talk about uh, these algorithms, there are certain principal concepts which has been identified and they have put into a format of uh, graphics where these basic principle has been identified. And these basic principles are primarily to highlight the importance of uh, certain critical actions that are required for management of cardiac arrest patients. So these uh, uh, links, whether we talk about calls, BCLS or CCLS, they, if they are followed and they are understood and they are translated into algorithm format, the optimal outcome of CPR would based on these links. So it becomes very important to know them, understand them, and appropriately execute these interdependent key links. And uh, this will further improve the chances of survival of a cardiac arrested patient. Now let's uh, take me uh, take you through the, uh, the various uh, core links. Uh, let's start with the compression only life support. Three essential core links are there in the calls uh, that can happen at any place of cardiac arrest outside the hospital. The early recognition and activation is important because time is an excess as just mentioned by Dr. Mukul Kapoor also and we will be talking subsequently as well. If we can early recognize them and timely activate the emergency medical services so that these patients can be shifted to the hospital and by this time somebody should be providing them early chest compression which is again very very essential because once the cardiac function stops, the perfusion stops and the, uh, the the cellular injury starts happening and it has been seen that with every minute without a cardiac uh, compression chest compression the chances of survival decreases by almost seven to ten percent and hence it becomes very essential that all the persons should be trained into cpr 
so that the basic principle of early chest compression can be initiated at all places, whether inside the hospital or outside the hospital. And having said that, since these four links are related to the lay persons, these patients, almost, almost more than 80% of patients' cardiac arrest will happen outside the hospital. And hence, for definitely management, these patients should get supervised care for resuscitation and other ancillary things that we'll talk about the, in the comprehensive cardiopulmonary life support. These patients must be shifted at the earliest to the nearest hospital where the care can be taken. Now, these three important links are very, very essential for patients uh, who gets cardiac arrest outside the hospital and the lay person should understand these links so that when they understand it, they can translate into this algorithmic format. Now, coming to the expert persons who find a cardiac arrested victim outside the hospital, but they are trained for it, the code links are a little different here. Now, since these are uh, personals who are aware of the various resuscitation aspects, but since the cardiac arrest has happened outside the hospital, they have limitations of various infrastructural things available. There may be absence of uh, manpower. There may be absence of uh, other advanced equipments that uh, includes the uh, intravenous access, the drugs, the resuscitation equipments for airway management, and so on and so forth. So in the absence of those uh, uh, advanced equipments, the even a trained person outside the hospital, we can put it, is handicapped to provide a comprehensive care. But since he's trained, he can provide an additional care to these patients even though he is outside the hospital, even though there is no infrastructural availability there. And that's why the code links for adult BCLS outside the hospital by an advanced, by and trained person are different. So what it means is early recognition and activation because he is outside the hospital, he may not be getting those comprehensive cares. And hence, he just not only recognizes the cardiac arrest, but also activates the emergency medical services and simultaneously he should provide early high quality CPR. So here we are using terminology which is very essential to understand each word is important. Early, high quality. Early means I mentioned each minute delay 7 to 8, 10 percent chances decreases of survival. So it has to be done within seconds, maybe minutes, but not less than 2 to, uh, two to 3 minutes. High quality. The choreography of chest compression other events are only successful if a quality standards are maintained, and I am sure the subsequent speakers will be talking about what do we mean by high quality CPR. Now, since majority of uh, these patients usually have arrhythmias and the treatment modality, or you can say treatment of choice is electrical therapy or defibrillation. Now, since they are trained personals, they should be providing early defibrillation because that will be converting an abnormal rhythm, arrhythmia, into a normal sinus rhythm, and hence, and this remains the treatment of choice. So this has to be uh, provided to these patients at the earliest. And obviously these patients again would be shifted to the nearest hospital so that other definitive management can be done for these patients. Again, these core links are translated into a stepwise approach of algorithm and we'll be discussing in detail subsequently. Now coming to the next core links of the algorithm, which is the comprehensive life support. And when we talk about the comprehensive life support, uh, we should be talking about those links, those basic principles, which are equally essential. And since it is happening inside the hospital by a trained personnel, each of these is, uh, is uh, an important link where the patient outcome will depend upon. So for the adult comprehensive cardiopulmonary life support, we have five essential core links. We're going to start with uh, the also nowadays we just not talk about the uh, curative aspect or or uh, uh, recovery of the patient, but we also talk about the preventive aspect. So here we need to look for the pre-arrest rhythms. We know that a patient of a renal failure uh, who has gone undergone an acute renal shutdown may have hyperkalemia can go into cardiac arrest. So that's why we need to identify the pre-arrest condition in these patients and these patients requires monitoring and management accordingly. But once uh, in spite of this management, some of these patients can have cardiac arrest. So we need to recognize early. Now, since this is happening inside the hospital, 
uh, we can use the activation of code view team or CPR team or research history team, whatever the nomenclature is. But those teams need to be activated so that when we talk of team dynamics, uh, it comprises of uh, three to five people who can, uh, in, a, in a way of a well-structured approach, can take care of various aspects of resuscitation, uh, which we'll be discussing subsequently in a CCLS algorithm. The basic crux of high-quality CPR must be maintained here. And since uh, there may not be a dearth of manpower, a sufficient number of people may be available. Some person, some person should be physically supervising them to maintain a high quality CPR. Early defibrillation, as I mentioned, adult patients, more than 80 to 85% of patients would have lesions of uh, cardiac arrhythmias and defibrillation remains the treatment of choice. Early defibrillation is required. Now herein, uh, we are not keeping AED because this is inside the hospital. We are talking about the manual defibrillator because there are a couple of other things that we need to identify. And since this is happening inside the hospital, since the CPR, the, since the persons are trained for CPR, so this is expected that they identify the rhythm because these patients may be having a monitoring of ECG as the first link itself says early recognition. So these patients may be on cardiac monitor. So we need to identify those rhythms and treat them accordingly so that these patients return back to normal sinus rhythm. After high quality CPR, uh, we need to continue the advanced aspects which includes airway, intravenous access, drugs and treatment of the underlying disease, which will be discussing uh, various causative uh, events which are including under the IRC mnemonic of hit the target, we will be discussing subsequently. All these needs to be intervened and managed in the ambit of fifth link of adult CCLS. And once the patient is revived, they should receive post-resuscitation care. This is very essential because patient is having an underlying disease, maybe a MI, maybe a renal failure, maybe a metabolic abnormality. So this may have been treated uh, intro during the uh, ongoing resuscitation, but uh, they may not be amenable to completely taken care during the resuscitation. For example, say patients with MI. So these patients may require some cath interventions and hence the post resuscitation care also included this plus also the complications that probably would have happened during the resuscitation needs to be taken care of so these all links needs to be translated into a shepwise algorithmic approach we'll be discussing subsequently but thus whenever we are learning teaching or practicing these uh, uh, algorithms we need to remember that these are the basic principles that must be adhered for any stepwise approach and these key concepts or this uh, graphical metamorphic description is essential to understand for any CPR activities that is being done. Thank you so much and uh, we'll move to the next uh, speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. Uh, I did not introduce uh, Rakesh. Rakesh is one of the premier persons who has uh, helped form this guideline and we are very indebted to Rakesh for that. We come to the next uh, speaker and the, and the next speaker is uh, uh, Moed, Moed, could you please share your slides? Moed is a, another premier person in uh, in this formation of these guidelines. And he, as you all know, he is the professor from JNU, uh, Jawala Nehru um, Medical College at Aligarh. Moed, please. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mukul, sir. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be there with you again. And uh, um, I'll be very fast because I think uh, most of the things have been covered by uh, my our previous speaker. Uh, so naturally, uh, the code links have already been discussed by Rakesh. So we'll pick up catch up from here. So naturally, if you in in COLS comprehensive only uh, comprehension only life support, uh, you can a person can uh, uh, get a patient or a victim uh, who, who is already being resuscitated or being resuscitated at the time. At the same time, he can be collapsed in front of, front of the patient uh, person concerned. So first thing is ensure that uh, the, the scene is safe. So before doing anything, you must uh, you must be very careful that whomsoever you are you are trying to approach, that victim should be in a safe place. Otherwise, if he is not safe, obviously you will not be safe because if you touch him or if you try to approach him, you will be on also in danger. So naturally, you have different scenarios where these are the places where probably uh, the patient the uh, the victim is not in a safe place. Uh, except of you, supposing in this patient where patient victim is in a in a in a in a cafeteria or the victim is in a gym 
So these are the places which are safe, but otherwise rest of the rest of the places is not safe. And actually, you need to bring these patients in a safe place before you resuscitate this patient. And uh, when you when you when you try to bring them in the patient, you need to uh, take the help of the local people. And otherwise, it is not possible that you'll be able to uh, bring him to a safe place. Safe uh, place. So once you brought him to a safe place, the sec first thing you should see is you need to check response. And we're trying to check response. You face the patient. Uh, don't try to check the patient at the back of the patient, uh, standing at the back of the patient. So naturally, you face the patient and you try to tap on the shoulder. Don't give a jerk because you don't know exactly what is the status of the patient's uh, cervical region. So naturally, you uh, tap on the shoulder and you try in the, either in the local language or, uh, uh, or the language you are comfortable with and, uh, and try, try to say, hello, are you okay? And uh, are, are you all right? And, uh, and then you see the response. If the patient is having verbal response or purposeful movement is there or the patient is breathing normally. So naturally the patient is, could be either in a state of response, the patient could be responsive or patient could be, uh, patient could be non-responsive. So the patient could be in two status, either he is responsive, if he's responsive, try to shift him uh, to a local uh, medical center facility where the patient can be taken care of. And if he is not responsive, Actually, you need to shout for help. Now, this is the time when you got to call for uh, the additional help, which could be in the format of you, if you have a, a mobile phone or if you can, uh, if you have an, another person in front of you, or you have a local number, which is 108, mostly in most of the places, which is an emergency number, you can call that number and ask him, uh, ask those uh, people who are there to help you out. And uh, now the point is, what are you going to say? Because nowadays we have mobile phone. Naturally, you can call uh, from, with the help of your mobile phone. And when you're calling him, you uh, the person who's on the other side of the mobile, you need to identify yourself first. And you need to uh, also identify your location. Where are you? Because the person who's going to be helping you after uh, being informed, he has to know your location. And at the same time, you've got to tell him that how many victims are there and uh, what is the age of the victim, the sex of the victim, and general condition of the victim. And then you see the number of rescuer, how many people are there who is trying to rescue this victim. Most importantly, uh, when you inform these, uh, uh, these, when you give these informations, don't leave the phone and don't switch off the phone unless the person who's on, sitting on the other side of the phone, he tells you that you go ahead because he might be asking you some more questions about the victim. So naturally you wait for till he tells you that yes, you can now, uh, uh, now you can carry on your uh, rescue, rescuing the, the victim. So this is very important. And so once you have informed him, then you start, uh, start for chest compression. Now once, one very important thing is when you are trying to uh, you know, uh, just as, uh, when you're trying to uh, uh, you, you check the response, you can also try to scan the patient's chest whether the patient is also having breathing or not. So once you start chest response, uh, chest compression, you go for five cycles of chest compression. And how do you go for a chest compression? This is very important because in our guideline, it is very different from the other guideline. So you need to identify the Ziffert process first, the lower end of the breastbone, and with the help of your two fingers, keep the heel of the hand uh, just two fingers above the, the Ziffard process and then keep the other heel on top of the first, uh, first, uh, first hand and then you try to interlock your fingers and once you interlock your fingers, then you try to, the elbows should be straight, this elbows is fixed, elbows should be straight, the shoulder should be on top of the victim's chest, above the victim's chest and the fingers are interlocked and you give uh, 30, com uh, 30 compressions and that means push at least five centimeter, but not more than six centimeter hard, uh, 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 six, six centimeters down uh, the, on, on the chest and compress at the rate of 120 times per minute uh, and, at this, and allow the chest com to completely recoil. Now, this is what is of particularly a high quality CPR. So when you say of high quality CPR means you're trying to compress the chest around five to six centimeter depth. You're trying to give a rate of compression rate of 120 per minute. And at the same time, you are allowing the chest to recoil. But very importantly, do not stop chest compression. You go on doing giving this chest compression. While you are giving the chest compression, you need to count. And how do you count how many chest compressions you're giving? You chant at the rate, say, 1, 1,000, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, until you go to 30. So this is what is very important. You need to count because when you count loudly, the other person who's standing right, who, the second rescuer, the rescuer which is there with you, he will be able to also know that this is the number of, the number of uh, uh, completion you've already given. 
So maintain the speed, the number of chest compressions F. If you are more than one person, you try to interchange every after every five cycles. How do you interchange? We, I mean, the subsequent speaker will be able to tell you. So now you check, once you've done this, you go in five cycles of 30 chest compressions. Uh, uh, and after the fifth cycle, you check response. You see whether the patient is again moving or coughing or vocalizing. And if the patient is doing as such, then obviously, you know, the patient is becoming responsive. If the patient is responsive, naturally you straight away try to shift the patient or put the patient in a recovery position uh, or lateral position primarily. And if he's not responsive, you strike straight away, go st start the chest compression again. So this is what you're supposed to do. And once this is, this cycle should continue till you are being able to, uh, you are being uh, helped by the ad advanced people whom you have already given a call. So, so how long to continue the CPR? Very importantly, till medical help arrives or another trained rescuer arrives or the victim is revived. Obviously, the signs of life will be there. That means the patient is vocalizing, the patient is moving, the patient is breathing. So if these signs are alive, you're not going to, you, you'll be tried to, you'll try to monitor this patient, putting the patient in a lateral position. Rescuer is exhausted. Now, if you're exhausted, obviously, you are not going to, you'll not be able to rescue the, I mean, uh, resuscitate this patient, go for a chest compression because you have to, I mean, you have to take rest to so naturally you'll not be able to do. So now, at that point of time, you can stop uh, uh, going for a chest compression and uh, uh, when the place becomes unsafe so not when the patient is, when the place is unsafe you obviously you're going to stop the uh, resuscitation so th these are this is how uh, how long you're going to start start, uh, start cpr i mean how long you're going to continue cpr now if the patient is becoming responsive that means the patient is victim is moving he's coughing or vocalizing place the victim in a lateral position and how do you put a lateral position obviously the subsequent speaker will be able to tell you so when not to start CPR, now when you should not stop CPR, means if the scene is not safe, as we have already said that you first ensure safety that the, the patient, victim is in a safe place, bring him to a safe place and start CPR. Patient is responsive, obviously you're not going to do a start CPR. Victim becomes stiff body, that means the patient's rigor mortis that already start, start, uh, has started is taking place. So naturally you are not going to start uh, uh, CPR because the irre irreversible death has already started and uh, you would not start CPR to this patient. So now this is how the algorithm looks overall. And uh, thank you so much. Any questions, we are going ready to take it up after the all the, all, after all the speakers. So you can uh, you can get all the information in www.cprindia.in. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Boyd. Uh, thank you for that excellent talk. Uh, we now move on to the next talk, and that is on basic cardiac life support, that is BCLS, as we call it. And this uh, talk will be delivered by Dr. Paul Raphael. Dr. Paul, please share your slides. Dr. Paul is the professor and head of anesthesiology at Trisur, uh, at Trisur, that is Amla Medical College. He is a big proponent of our guidelines, and he has been very active in Kerala in teaching people these guidelines. Dr. Paul, please. Good evening, all, and uh, uh, I thank the ICA uh, and the ICA academic team for giving me an opportunity to uh, speak for today's webinar. And uh, I'm really proud and happy that uh, we are uh, the IRC is an uh, observer invitee uh, in ILCOR, and uh, it's all uh, under the leadership of uh, Dr. Chakrav, sir. So as the, all have uh, spoken that we have uh, three algorithms and you can see that uh, these are all uh, very simple, clear recommendations and beautifully designed algorithms. And you can see it is uh, color coded uh, to, uh, for easily uh, to recognize. So I'll be, I have I've been asked to speak about the basic uh, cardiopulmonary life support and uh, that is BCLS and you all know that uh, this is for resuscitating a cardiac arrest between by, uh, by a doctor or a nurse or a paramedic uh, outside the hospital. So these uh, references, uh, references are uh, from the IGA, IGA number 2017 issue and this manuscript you can uh, download from the web, uh, our web page. To uh, emphasize, uh, like already it has been spoken uh, that core links, that we have four core links in BCLS, that's early recognition, you have to uh, uh, recognize it early and then activate the emergency response system. You should start immediately the high quality CPR as there are there is no 
perfusion for this patient and uh, the coronary perfusion pressure will be zero at that time. So we have to start early and for the cardiac output. And uh, defibrillation, it has been seen that if you are starting early, that survival is better and uh, you have to transfer the patient. So uh, the, uh, these are the uh, situations uh, you may encounter that you observe a person suddenly collapsing in front of you or somebody is already collapsed when you saw him or you have arrived at a scene where a lay person is providing CPR, that is he is providing a, a pulse and then you are taking over to do BCLS. So this is the algorithm proper. And uh, uh, Dr. Mohit, uh, he has already spoken about uh, the, the first thing is about ensuring the safe place. And these are the unsafe places. Uh, and uh, you will have to take the patient uh, from this place to a safe place. Now, after that, you are checking the response that has also been explained. You are uh, coming in front of the patient and tapping on the shoulders and saying, are you all right? Then you are saying, any verbal response or purposeful movement is there or not. And uh, you are coming to a conclusion that the patient is uh, responsive, then you'll have to observe the victim, put the patient in the recovery position and shift to the nearest uh, medical facility. If it is uh, unresponsive, then definitely you are shouting for help, help. And you are calling the national number that 108, uh, asking them to bring the AED or defibrillator and all the emergency equipments. And this has been already uh, told to you uh, uh, that what to say during this call. Uh, you have to identify your location, especially because the ambulance, they may be uh, coming in the ambulance and they, there should not be any waste of time. After that, you are checking the breathing while palpating the carotid pulse. So you have to perform within five to 10 seconds, uh, ideally five and not more than 10 seconds. At the same time, when you are uh, palpating the carotid, uh, you have to scan the chest for whether there is breathing or not. So the, uh, this all uh, your, uh, must be familiar where to do it, that locate thyroid prominence and trachea within, with your, your two fingers, slide into the groove between the trachea and neck muscles. Uh, that is on the same side and uh, palpate simultaneously, scan the chest and uh, for breathing. So you will be coming into either one of these condition, either uh, uh, there will be normal breathing with a definite current pulse, then place the uh, patient in a recovery position, reassess every two minutes and shift the patient to the nearest medical facility. Or there may be no breathing with a definite cardiac pulse, so that uh, carotid pulse, sorry. So then you'll have to provide breaths. That is provide breaths every five seconds, that's 12 breaths per minute and reassess every two minutes. See, one of the uh, condition where uh, you have a respiratory arrest, the commonest cause is tongue fall, uh, where uh, uh, you'll have to keep the airway patent. So when you do the head tilt and chin lift, the tongue will be lifted up and the, the airway becomes patent. But in cases of suspected uh, cervical spine fracture, you will have to do jaw thrust. So uh, the breaths can be given mouth to mouth, mouth, uh, mouth to mask, and uh, you have the mask ventilation. So that's mouth to mask. And uh, the end point, what is the end point? End point is the visible chest rise. So you provide one breath every five seconds in this condition. And the third part is there is no breathing and there is no carotid pulse. There you'll have to start cycles of 30 uh, compressions and two breaths. So 30 compression that takes around 15 seconds approximately. That has been already been explained to you where you have to do your chest compression and you have to give two breaths. That is each breath over one second and, and one second for the aspiration after the first breath. Then you continue five cycles, 30 compressions and two breaths and again check the uh, carotid pulse after that. And uh, if there is a pulse, then uh, if there's a pulse present then give the respiration alone, then, then if there is no pulse, then you'll have to repeat the five cycles, 30 compressions and two breaths. You continue the cycles until you get a defibrillator and uh, so defibrillator, see what you have to do, you have to attach either uh, a defibrillator or an AED, you attach, that, that's the place you attach, uh, it's a, there are two uh, pads, 
uh, or you can use a paddle also where you have to attach is uh, below the below the clavicle that's the mid clavicle line on the right and on the left uh, left in the mid axillary line as to the apex, apex peak so the one uh, one thing what you have to remember is that while attaching the pads don't stop chest compression as i told you there is no absolutely no cardiac output and coronary perfusion pressure will be low so you'll have to continue while attaching the pads but while analyzing the rhythm don't touch the the, uh, you should not touch the patient because the AED will analyze it as uh, it's a normal rhythm if you are continuing the compression. Then, uh, like uh, either it will be shockable if you are using AED, AED is uh, automatic external defibrillator. Uh, it will identify the rhythm which needs a shock and will prompt you to give a shock. It has got voice prompts. If you are using defibrillator, you can see whether it is a shockable rhythm or a non-shockable rhythm. And you have, to, if it is a shockable rhythm, if you are using defibrillator, you have to start with 120 joules and escalate to 200 joules. If AD will be auto-selected and will give the uh, the necessary uh, shock. So the step for the use of AD, you should all know that there are four steps. And the first is the turn on the AD. And second thing is to expose the chest and attach the pads uh, where I already mentioned and do not interrupt the CPR. Then you'll have to analyze the rhythm. At the, uh, when, you, when, when you are analyzing, do not touch the patient during the step. And make sure that no person in contact to the victim by a quick visual survey and loudly say that I'm clear, you're clear, every, everyone is clear and deliver the shock. So as soon as you deliver the uh, shock, the, most of the people, what they try to uh, see the monitor and see whether it's a normal pulse or not. See, e even if it is normal, that is not sufficient for an effective cardiac output. So you will have to resume immediately CPR and do the five cycles of 30 compressions and two breaths. Then, uh, if, uh, like again, uh, you'll have to continue uh, checking the uh, defibrillator and, and, and the cycle should go on. Continue the cycle of CPR till the victim becomes responsive or if there is a pulse or breathing returns or victim is shifted to the medical uh, facility. So if, if victim starts to breathe normally, place in the recovery position. So that's all uh, about the BCLS algorithm and that is colored green. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, it was an excellent presentation in brief talking about the entire BCLS algorithms. Now we move on to the comprehensive cardiac life support algorithm and it presented by Dr. Jiggy Devatia. Dr. Jigad Devatia is the professor and head of anesthesia at Tata Memorial Hospital. And I'm sure all of you know that he was the past editor in chief of the Indian Journal of Anesthesiology and also the past president of the Critical Care Society. Uh, Dr. Jiggy, please. Uh, good evening, uh, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to present the CCLS uh, guidelines. Thank the ICA and uh, especially the IRC led uh, very uh, passionately by Dr. Chakrarao, sir. So I'll be presenting the CCLS, the Comprehensive Cardiopulmonary Life Support Guidelines of the IRC. Uh, uh, this is meant for trained personnel inside the hospital, right? So unlike the COLS and VCLS, this is exclusively for uh, patients who have a cardiac arrest uh, inside the hospital. And this is the composite algorithm. And uh, so this is a CCLS algorithm and it's colored blue and it's got three sort of parts. The first part is the assessment over here. And then the second part is you start uh, and of course you start the chest compressions and breathing. And then the second panel deals with what you do when you get the defibrillator available. And the third panel which is uh, not there in the previous uh, guidelines is the advanced uh, life support drugs and uh, airway equipment and uh, venous access, which is done in the process of comprehensive cardiac life support. And then of course there is post-resuscitation care. So this is the sort of overview 
of the algorithm. I'll quickly go over some parts of the algorithm. And so, of course, uh, we've already covered how you assess the patient, right? And then, of course, if the patient is responsive, we just monitor. If he's non-responsive, then you need to activate the code blue team. Now, this is uh, happening in the hospital, so you need to activate a code blue team. Remember, this arrest may be taking place anywhere in the hospital, not necessarily in the OR, not necessarily in the ICU where you've got experts available. This could be happening anywhere. And so you need to activate the code blue team or the whatever is your equivalent of the code blue team in your hospital. And that team would, and also if a local uh, defibrillator and crash card is available, that needs to be brought in over here. And of course, you check breathing and you check breathing and you check the carotid pulse and don't take more than 10 seconds to make this sort of assessment, right? You've already seen how you check the carotid pulse and how you look for breathing. And if there is breathing with a pulse, then there's nothing more to be done except to monitor the patient and reassess. If there is a abnormal breathing, so even a gasping breathing or abnormal breathing, but a pulse, then it's treated as respiratory arrest. And then you need to provide respiratory support by means of bag mask ventilation and one breath every five seconds and reassess and keep checking the carotid pulse every two minutes. And the worst situation, which you're going to talk about in more detail is there is no breathing or abnormal or gasping breathing, and there is no definite carotid pulse. And here you start chest compressions and two breaths and the cycle is of each cycle is of 30 compressions and two breaths. Right? And you need to give five such cycles, so five cycles of 30 compressions and two breaths. And again, we know how to give the chest compressions and breathing is by a bag valve mask device initially. Right, So bag mask valve device, one breath over one second. Uh, so one second for inspiration, one second for expiration. And you press the bag so that you just see adequate chest rise. We've seen how you give uh, adequate chest compressions. Do not interrupt chest compressions, chest compression rate as pre previously mentioned, 120 times per minute, uh, allow adequate recoil. And again, if you have more than one rescuer, you, you can interchange rescuers with after every five cycles. Okay, So breathing, 30 cycle, thirty compressions, two breaths, right? Each breath over one second, one second pause and allow for exhalation. Do not interrupt chest compressions. And like I mentioned, the end point is just a visible chest rise. That's a normal tidal volume breath. You need not hyperventilate or very uh, bag mask very hard just till you get adequate chest rise. Okay. So now you're giving, uh, you've assessed the patient, it's found to be unresponsive, no breathing, no pulse. You're giving five cycles of chest compressions with two breaths. Okay? And you check the carotid pulse again after five cycles. If the pulse is present, you've done well. If the pulse is absent, then you know you now continue the five cycles of 30 by two until the defibrillator arrives. Right now, as soon as the defibrillator arrives, you need to uh, defibrillate the patient. And you've also seen how to attach the defibrillator. Right? Do not uh, stop chest compressions. Do not touch the patient when analysis is going on. And essentially, your rhythm is shockable or non-shockable. Now, if you've got an AED, then it will tell you whether it's to shock and or not to shock. If you don't have an AED, it's a manual sort of defibrillator. You need to recognize the shockable rhythms, which are VF, uh, ventricular fibrillation, or ventricular tachycardia without a pulse. Or you have non-shockable rhythms, which could be asystole, which could be uh, pulses electrical activity. Right? Now, if it's shockable, then you give a shock. We recommend you start with 120 joules for a biphasage, and the next shock should be 200 joules. Right? Uh, if it's non-shockable, then you don't shock, and then you resume CPR. So once you've given a shock, uh, you give five cycles of 30 compressions and two breaths, and ensure high-quality CPR. So we must focus on high-quality CPR. And if you go through the manuscript, it tells you how to assess uh, for high-quality CPR. So this algorithm should be read in combination with the manuscript. Right. right. So these are the shockable rhythm. That's ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia. And non-shockable is asystole or pulseless electrical activity. Right. Now, once you, while you're doing the defibrillation and the patient has not revived, then you now need to consider uh, the other interventions uh, during the uh, CCLS. Right. And essentially, these are venous access, airway, and drugs. Now, venous access, uh, you can, uh, are uh, usually it's intravenous access and intravenous should be taken on the upper limb. 
don't try and put a central line, but if a central line is already there, please go ahead and use a central line, right? Uh, uh, other interventions include anti-arrhythmics and uh, check for reversible causes. And of course, all this, while all this is going on, ensure high quality CPR, that is chest compressions at 120 minute, uh, 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 30 by two. And once a definitive airway is in, once a definitive airway is in, then you give chest compressions at 120 per minute and one breath every six seconds without a need to go in cycles of 30 and two. Okay. The root of access is intravenous uh, as far as possible and uh, give uh, 20 ml bolus of IV fluid after drug is given and elevate the extremity. If you are not able to get an IV route, so if you are struggling for IV, <clears throat> alternatives are the interosseous and the endotracheal routes. The interosseous can be given either in most commonly in the proximal tibia or maybe even into the humerus. And there are sometimes if you're available, special interosseous needles. Otherwise you can, if the patient is intubated, then you can use the endotracheal route and drugs like naloxon, atropine, uh, Adrenaline and lignocaine, naval uh, acronym, can be given uh, intratracheally, two and a half times the IV dose. And follow it. once you squirt that into the trachea, you follow, dilute, they have to be diluted in five to 10 ml of normal saline and then bag the patient to get the drug into the circulation. <clears throat> next, you, next intervention would be the airway and then the drugs, right? So the drugs, now the airway is usually an endotracheal tube, but again, do not waste time and do not uh, it should be done only by an expert and do not interrupt chest compressions to get the endotracheal tube no more than 10 second interruption of chest compression so bag mask ventilation is one airway other airways could include a, a laryngeal mask airway as well okay the drugs are adrenaline which is the commonest one which is one milligrams right diluted to 10 ml has a bolus irrespective of the type of rhythm. So whether it's VF or whether it's uh, asystole or PA, you should give adrenaline every three to five minutes and give ongoing chest compressions. After the first two or three sets of five cycles of 30 by two, if the patient still remains in VF or pulseless ventricular tachycardia, then you should give them antiarrhythmics and the drug of choice initially is amiodarone, 300 milligrams as a bolus, followed by another dose if the arrhythmia persists. If amiodarone is not available, or you can also try lignocaine as an alternate in patients with uh, ongoing uh, arrhythmias. Again, to emphasize, continue high quality CPR, either 30 by two, cycle, five cycles, if there is no definitive airway, or if you've got a definitive airway, then 120 chest compressions per minute and one breath every six seconds. And now you must always at simultaneously try and identify, investigate and treat reversible causes because very often, sometimes, especially in the hospital setting, there might be a reversible cause for the patient going into a cardiac arrest and the reversible causes are hit the target is the demonic which you do. So hypoxia, acidosis, which is increased hydrogen ions, tension pneumothorax, toxins, hypovolemia, electrolyte imbalance, hypo or hyperkalemia, most common. Tamponade, that's cardiac tamponade, acute coronary syndrome, that's a myocardial infarction, raised ICP, hyper or hypoglycemia, that's glucose, embolism, that's pulmonary thromboembolism, and temperature, that's hypothermia. So look for reversible causes and try and treat the reversible causes as your resuscitation is going on. And of course, you need to make sure that you know something about this patient, which could help you identify a potential cause and a potentially reversible cause either from the notes or from the review from the patient's uh, attendants who are there, right? You may need to send investigations, most commonly a blood gas, but please remember that wh whatever you may be doing, you should not interrupt chest compressions and other aspects of resuscitation such as defibrillation. So this must continue and this other things must happen on the side. If the patient revives, that's good. With signs of uh, circulation, you've got the return of spontaneous circulation then you go on to post resuscitation care, which is essentially continued ventilation, inotropic support, vasopressor support if required, uh, and you know, shift the patient to the intensive care unit. So this again is the overall sort of uh, overview of the algorithm. Uh, one is don't forget the links, uh, uh, the, the chain uh, of uh, CCLS, as was mentioned by Dr. Rakesh Kar, and then you go on to identification, defibrillation, and other uh, drugs, uh, venous access, airway, and drugs during CCLS. 
So thank you very much for listening and we'll be happy to take questions at the end of all the talks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jiggy. It was again a very comprehensive talk. In a very short time, you've been able to cover very important aspects. And uh, as we go ahead uh, with the next talk, and the next talk is by Dr. Baljeet Singh. Dr. Baljeet Singh is a, a ex-director professor from Jeevanth Hospital at Delhi. And presently, he is the professor and head of department at uh, SGT uh, University in Gurgaon. And uh, he is a uh, very trained resuscitator. And he will. Uh, his role today is to talk about auditing of CPR uh, training. And that is something very important that you should ensure that the teaching and quality is good. Dr. Baljeet, please. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mukul, for the privilege to uh, uh, speak among the galaxy of uh, people who are uh, there uh, in this webinar. And of course, the opportunity given by Indian College of Anesthesiologists and uh, Indian Association Council Federation. Uh, okay, so we'll be looking at quality. And uh, <clears throat> what is quality? Uh, it's basically a distinctive attribute or a characteristic that is possessed by someone or something. Uh, or the standard of something as measured against another thing that is considered as gold standard. So it's just like uh, if we have to compare analgesics, we compare it against morphine because we know morphine is the best drug available. So that's kind of a gold standard. In simple terms, uh, it is the degree of excellence of something. And when you take it to the person, how well the person does the job. So that is what defines the quality of the person or of, uh, of, uh, uh, of something or the process. <clears throat> there are four key areas of CPR quality and uh, we'll take uh, these one by one. One is metrics of CPR performance, how CPR is performed. And secondly, uh, monitoring of the performance and the feedback. Third, the team level logistics and the continuous quality improvement. Uh, we all know that uh, oxygen delivery is a central goal of uh, CPR that we are performing. And for this, we must generate uh, you know, blood flow uh, through, through effective chest compressions. And uh, when we do the chest compressions, uh, uh, we are trying to replicate the activity of the heart that is uh, pushing the blood forward and uh, you know, uh, maintain the circulation. Now, coronary perfusion pressure is the primary determinant of the myocardial blood flow during the CPR. And we need to maximize coronary perfusion pressure during CPR to achieve better hemodynamics and improve uh, patient, improved patient survival. <clears throat> there are five main components of the high performance of CPR. One, the chest compression fraction, chest compression rate, chest compression depth, chest recoil, and ventilation. Now, a chest compression fraction is the proportion of the time that is spent performing chest compressions during cardiac arrest. Now, if uh, it's been uh, 10 minutes or uh, whatever time is there, and if we are spending, say, 50% of the time in chest compression, the chest compression fraction is 50%. If we are spending it 80% of the time in chest compression, during that period of cardiac arrest, it comes to 80% of chest compression fraction. In patients who attained uh, return of spontaneous circulation, the mean chest compression during uh, duration has been found to be significantly longer. And the authors uh, concluded that the majority of the participants who have return of spontaneous circulation after cardiac arrest and uh, uh, resuscitation, they had a chest compression fraction of at least 80%. So uh, we must maintain the chest compression fraction to 80% to have a reasonable uh, degree of success uh, after uh, during CPR. We, and how do we maintain uh, chest compression fraction more than 80%? Uh, for this, we, has, we have to minimize the interruption in chest compression that has been uh, mentioned earlier also uh, by various speakers. And if at all the chest compressions have to be there, these have to be you know, uh, as short as possible. To maximize uh, the perfusion and uh, chest compression fraction, IRC uh, advocates that the, the pause in the chest compression should be as less as possible. Uh, the high quality chest compression uh, is a crucial factor that determines the survival of cardiac arrest patients and all these guidelines uh, that uh, Indian uh, Resuscitation Council has published in the, in the month of uh, November 2017, these three guidelines, uh, these, all these factors are very well highlighted in these guidelines. We come next to the chest compression rate. Uh, there is a direct association between the compression rate and survival and optimum target of 100 to 120 compressions per minute is suggested. <clears throat> Rates above 
uh, this rate uh, above this uh, you know 120 or below that range uh, reduces the survival to discharge uh, of the patient however the studies have shown that the rate uh, when you know chest compression is being done is usually lower than the range range that is 100 to 120 uh, compression uh, here, the Indian Association Council uh, suggests that the chest compression rate should be 120 per minute and it should not be range because here in case there is some degree of uh, slowing of the rate, I mean from 120 it may come down to, uh, if at all it comes to that, uh, still the patient has a reasonable chance of survival, uh, but in case we have a range of 100 to 120 and uh, we are below that range of 100, so the chances of uh, recovery or the chances of uh, revival of the patient becomes uh, become less. <clears throat> the next issue is the chest compression depth. And uh, it's been uh, reported that uh, chest compression depth of less than 38 millimeters uh, results in decrease of return of spontaneous circulation and rate of survival. And a depth of more than 44 millimeters in adults uh, has been reported to be adequate to ensure optimal outcome. However, literature suggests again that the rescuers often do not compress the chest deep enough despite the recommendations which are there. Uh, it has been reported that chest compression depth of more than 50 millimeters, that's five centimeters, improves success and return of spontaneous circulation in adults. <clears throat> uh, the next factor is the chest recoil. Chest recoil is essential because as the chest expands, uh, the negative pressure that is generated uh, when the chest is expanding, this draws the blood back into the heart and also uh, it, it lets the air uh, back into the lungs so that when you compress it next, the blood goes out of the heart and of course, some amount of air also comes out. Incomplete chest re-expansion happens when the chest is not allowed to fully recoil. And this occurs when the rescuer who is performing the chest compression leans over the patient's chest. Leaning increases the right atrial pressure, decreases cerebral and coronary perfusion pressure and left ventricular myocardial flow. This decreases venous return and the cardiac output. Now, this is how the chest compression is done. <clears throat> you have a cross section of the chest here. Uh, the heart is uh, full with blood and the heel of the hand is very nicely uh, positioned over the sternum. And when you compress it, this is what happens. The heart gets compressed between the sternum and the vertebral column posteriorly. Whatever blood is there, uh, a large part of it goes uh, forward. It can't go backward, of course. And uh, when you allow, when you take the pressure off the sternum, <clears throat> the heart fills up again, and it is ready to be compressed again, so that the blood, whatever has come into the heart during recoil of the chest, now is ready to be pushed forward with the next compression. So that's how it happens. We come to the next part that is ventilation. The need to supplement existing oxygen, oxygen in the blood varies with the type of arrest, whether it is arrhythmic or it is asphyxia. If the arrest is arrhythmic, oxygen content is initially sufficient and high quality chest compression alone can circulate the blood which is oxygenated, uh, reasonably oxygenated, uh, oxygenated at that time throughout the body. Compressions without ventilation in such patients would be adequate early. When asphyxia is the cause of rest, combination of ventilation and high quality chest compression is crucial to ensure oxygen delivery. Avoiding uh, excessive ventilation, uh, you know, providing sufficient oxygen is the goal of ventilation during CPR. However, it's often seen that excessive ventilation is done, uh, whether it is by way of the rate, respiratory rate, or it is by way, to, by, by way of tidal volume. And this is quite common during resuscitation. Chest compression only CPR has yielded similar survival outcomes from out of uh, hospital arrest as a standard CPR. So excessive ventilation is not really required. IRC therefore strongly recommends compression only life support, uh, that is COLS, if the rescuer is not familiar with mouse to mouse respiration, because if the rescuer is not familiar with uh, providing respiration, he will be wasting a lot of uh, precious time on uh, on on uh, resist on on uh, providing breath rather than uh, the chest compression which would uh, improve the circulation of the patient now uh, the monitoring and feedback they say that if you don't measure it you can't improve it studies have shown that even trained rescuers often had poor chest compression fraction ratio and depth of compressions with new technology it is now possible to monitor the quality of cpr in real time 
monitoring for CPR quality can be classified into physiological, that is how the patient is doing, and CPR performance metrics, how the rescuers are doing. Physiological data pertinent for monitoring include invasive hemodynamic data, that is arterial and centrovenous pressure and enteral carbon dioxide. And the studies have shown that coronary patient pressure is a primary determinant of myocardial blood flow during CPR, and survival is dependent on adequate myocardial blood flow and oxygen delivery. Coronary patient pressure during cardiac arrest is the difference between aortic, diastolic, and right atrial diastolic pressure, or in simple terms, it is the diastolic blood pressure minus the central venous pressure. Now, if we have invasive monitoring in place, invasive monitoring uh, like arterial and central venous line, successful adult resuscitation is more likely when coronary perfusion pressure is uh, more than 20 millimeters of mercury and when diastolic blood pressure is more than 25 to 30 millimeters of mercury. This physiological target is a primary endpoint when arterial and central venous catheters are in place at the time of cardiac arrest and CPR that is being done on the patient. Now, in case the patient has only the arterial line, there, the diastolic blood pressure is the primary endpoint, uh, and studies have indicated that the successful adult resuscitation depends on maintaining a diastolic blood pressure at more than 25 millimeters of mercury. So, if the diastolic blood pressure is less than 20 millimeters of mercury, there is need to improve the quality of CPR by optimizing chest compression parameters or vasopressors or both. So, the diastolic blood pressure should be tightened to more than 25 millimeters of mercury for adult patients. In case you have enteral carbon dioxide, uh, enteral carbon dioxide concentration during CPR primarily dependent on pulmonary blood flow and therefore reflect uh, the cardiac output. Failure to maintain enteral carbon dioxide at more than 10 millimeters of mercury during adult CPR reflects poor cardiac output and strongly predicts unsuccessful resuscitation. Thus, monitoring enteral carbon dioxide during CPR to assess blood flow uh, helps in two ways. One. Uh, you know, in case the enteral carbon dioxide less than uh, 10 millimeters of mercury, it suggests that there is need to improve the chest compression. And in case there is a, a value, a normal value uh, that is 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury, this suggests the return of spontaneous circulation has occurred and there's no need for further uh, chest compression. Now, monitoring how the rescues are doing, uh, there are monitors to measure CPR performance, uh, which are now available. They provide rescuers with invaluable real-time feedback on the quality of CPR delivered, data for debriefing after resuscitation, and retrospective information for quality improvement programs. Without measurement and subsequent understanding of CPR performance, improvement and optimized performance cannot occur. Providing CPR without monitoring performance, uh, performance is like flying an aeroplane without an altimeter. Uh, routine available feedback on CPR performance characteristics include chest compression rate, depth and recoil. Yes. Currently, certain important parameters that is chest compression fraction and pre-shock, perishock and post-shock pauses can be reviewed only retrospectively, whereas others like ventilation rate, airway pressure, tidal volume and duration of inflammation cannot be assessed adequately by current technology. So these are CPR mannequins, uh, the QCPR mannequins. Uh, the QCPR mannequins have some sort of uh, uh, software-based program where uh, the, 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 you know, there is some supervisor who can watch how the CPR is being performed. Uh, it, it, here is a group of six people and you can see that right upper corner, there is 100%. Uh, so the person who's performing that uh, CPR is doing 100% good. Whereas the people uh, there at the bottom, that is 74 and 72%, you need to uh, tell them that there is something wrong somewhere. And how to tell what is wrong? There are various uh, indicators of uh, doing that. Uh, you know, CPR good performance, no, no feedback needed. Uh, if the arrow is down, the yellow arrow, you can see uh, somewhere in the middle. It's not deep enough compression, so uh, the person must be given feedback to compress deeper. In case the arrow is up, that is incomplete release. The patient is, uh, the, the rescuer is leaning over the patient, so he need to release the chest so that recoil is good, so the more uh, blood comes to the heart and further more output uh, is generated. Uh, the, the next is too fast compression. If the meter, if the if the needle is in the yellow zone, so that means too fast compression. The person should be asked to compress slower, or too slow compression if the needle is on the other side, on the left side. So the the feedback should be given to improve the rate. Uh, 
and if you uh, perform uh, if you test uh, real time for individual persons so here in this case the compressions in which he uh, uh, fully released the chest is 81% and compressions with adequate depth more than 50 millimeters that's 5 centimeters 88% of those were uh, were caught so like that uh, you know uh, you can very clearly see where exactly the fault or the shortcoming of the person who is performing the uh, the cpr now uh, the role of team leader is a very important role uh, team leadership is associated with improved cpr performance especially uh, an increase in ccr which is central to the success of uh, uh, success uh, while you are performing cpr every resuscitation event should have a designated team leader who directs and coordinates all activities with a central focus on delivering high quality cpr his responsibility is to organize a team of experts into a cohesive team by directing and prioritizing essential activities this is where the uh, how the uh, team uh, leader is a team leader usually is at the foot end of the patient one compressor is on the right side of the patient it can be on the left of course and on the opposite side is uh, the person who is uh, uh, give uh, ready for defibrillation there is one person on the head end and there is another person towards the foot end that is to give iv medication and there is another sixth person who is recording all the events that are happening and that is that will be uh, sort of uh, for discussion at the after the cpr is over to improve uh, the process further so this is uh, another way of showing all the uh, team members who are performing uh, the resuscitation uh, <clears throat> interactions of cpr performance characteristics if the patient is not responding to resuscitative efforts that is enteral carbon dioxide is less than 20 minutes mercury team leaders should prioritize optimization of individual components of chest compression in the following order chest compression fraction uh, uh, sorry the compression fraction compression rate compression depth leaning and avoidance of excessive ventilation this order is recommended because there is a strong evidence for compression fraction rate and depth rather than the leaning so the team activities must be choreographed this again is the role of uh, the of the team leader uh, to minimize chest compression pause when it is absolutely essential it should be coordinated and performed simultaneously in a pit crew fashion just like the formula uh, racing cars they, they come into the pit immediately the tires are changed the fuel is loaded and you know in a flash the car goes off use the same brief pause to achieve multiple tasks so if you are having a interruption in the chest compression so you can perform different tasks in the, during the same time so that you don't waste any uh, more time now endotracheal intubation often accounts for long pauses in chest compression and uh, supraglottic uh, airways are alternatives but studies have shown that they have they don't have a good outcome now here uh, if the endotracheal intubation is to be performed the most experienced provider should first attempt and he should perform uh, and laryngoscopy during uh, the chest compressions which are ongoing and if at all a pause is required it should be kept short ideally uh, less than 10 seconds and it should be again uh, with with multiple uh, tasks that can be performed during those 10 seconds of interruption uh, pre shock phase is more likely to interrupt chest compression and how to minimize that apply the pads during ongoing chest compressions use technology that minimizes the interruptions that is rt uh, artifact waveform filters which are available now these days and uh, they enable the rhythm analysis uh, during uh, the ongoing chest compressions restart chest compressions without delay after delivery of the shock then uh, a tight regulation of the compression rate uh, is necessary once chest compression has begun achievement of the target rate is often the easiest parameter to adjust and maintain real time cpr feedback devices such as metronomes and music are known to decrease variability and result in compression rates closer to the target rate monitor and adjust for degradation in compression rate over time uh, how to uh, maximize compression depth ensure that the depth is uh, at least 5 uh, cm this parameter is one of the most difficult to achieve because the chest sizes vary from person to person and the compliance of the chest also varies so however the following are some strategies that can help ensure a firm hard surface backboard should be there at the back uh, but their placement may interrupt cpr so coordinate with other activities that those can be performed during that period of interruption so uh so as to minimize the interruption time optimize provider uh, mechanics of compression rotate chest compressors uh, every 2 seconds so that uh, every 2 minutes so that the compressor who is there uh, doing the chest compression may be exhausted after 5 cycles he needs to be uh, given rest and he will, he can come on and take over the role of the uh, airway uh, of the patient 
and the team leader should uh, monitor the uh, compressors as signs of fatigue and if if he find that uh, you know the person is fatigued he can uh, in, he can change uh, to another team member as quickly as possible even if 2 minutes have not passed so with proper communication and preparation switch over can be accomplished within 3 seconds uh excessive ventilation uh, was touched earlier and unlike the uh, compression characteristics ventilation is one skill that can be optimized in parallel with chest compressions do not take this is quite often seen uh, in a, with with over the less uh, rescuer uh, he will take a deep breath before he delivers it to the patient's uh, uh, patient's mouth so don't take because when you are taking a deep breath you are you are pushing a, maybe one and a half to two liters of air into the patient's mouth uh whatever lung can accommodate they will take there rest of the air will go into the stomach with progressive breath the stomach will go on increasing uh, dilating uh, you know it will get inflated the lower esophageal sphincter will open up whatever stomach contents are there they will they, they will be regurgitated and patient will aspirate so it's very important that when you are doing mouth to mouth to the patient uh the it should be just normal tidal volume that needs to be delivered to the patient's uh, mouth avoid leaning it's a bigger concern for taller rescuers and those who use step stools you can see that uh, you know this is a tall to two different uh, people of different heights here in case the the knee level of the rescuer is at a level lower than the level of uh, the surface where the patient is uh, is lying this would uh, lead to leaning after some time because the chest compression in this case uh, since the direction of the arms is not vertical above the sternum so the force of compression will be not exactly between the sternum towards the vertebral column but somewhat away so this will not compress the heart very well so the heart uh, if it is not compressed well there will be less blood which will be coming out uh, of uh, of it so the you know the cardiac output will be less with the chest compression now here uh, you know this is also that the patient uh, the rescuer is at a level the knee level is higher than the level at which the patient is lying so uh, few compression may be all right after some time the back will start uh, you know feeling the strain and the person will tend to lean over the patient and if he is leaning the, the recoil will not be there recoil you know if it's not full recoil so patient will have less blood coming back to the uh, to the heart so less cardiac output with the compression so that should be avoided there are certain stools which are available some sort of cpr stools now they are not a panacea you know if one might think that okay it's a cpr stool so this got to be adequate it's not uh, the cpr stool that decide it's the level your level with regard to the level of the uh, of the patient who is lying there the best of course is if the patient is lying on the floor and you are kneeling by the side of the patient your knees and the uh, you know the, the patient surface the surface where the patient is lying is the same so this is the you know the leaning possibility is uh, very less in this patient and uh, and the delivery of the force uh, will compress the heart best because it is between the sternum and the vertebral column that the heart will get compressed there are certain additional considerations uh, uh, with regard to the patient transport uh, mobile environment has additional challenges because uh, because the compressor is uh, not uh, strapped so while he is performing in case the ambulance takes a turn uh, you know the compressor can tumble around so there are certain factors uh, which affect manual chest compression like vehicle movement acceleration or deceleration of the vehicle rotational forces and they can compromise compression fraction rate and depth there is no consensus on the ideal ambulance speed which will minimize this but uh, you know uh, the what can be useful here is the use of mechanical device so this is sort of a mechanical device uh, you can see that in the center there is a special like thing which is uh, black in color so this goes up and down you can set the compression depth between 5 to 6 cm and it will continue to perform whether the ambulance is taking turn or is slow or fast or you know whatever, or even if it is like so so that th this is a useful device debriefing uh, is a focused discussion in which individual action and team performance are reviewed soon after the event this approach can be used for both out of or in hospital cardiac arrest to improve your uh, subsequent uh, you know uh, compress uh, subsequent cpr uh, activity so one simple approach is represented by a group huddle to discuss opinion as to what could have been done better in the uh, in, in you know what could have been done better in the patient that who you know, who got cpr just now 
there are certain checklists that can provide invaluable feedback directly from multiple sources and these post event checklists can be as simple as, uh, as a short debriefing checklist on specific quality metrics that can be easily filled out after the uh, arrest events now the continu continuous quality improvement use of systematic uh, continuous quality improvement approach has shown to optimize outcome despite the evidence these techniques are not consistently and uniformly applied and this leads to an uh, can i what is happening here unfortunately uh, with regard to there is some disturbance here yeah can this sharing poll results be so just cancel it sir uh unfortunately my i've cancelled it but it's the slides now don't move there is something happening here the slides are not moving well the indian scenario is that uh, compliance to cpr performance and documentation is very poor we all know that and each hospital and institute should have an internal quality improvement program for determining cpr guidelines uh, compliance initial training is required followed by periodic reeducation and future studies should assess the efficacy of these training sessions that is skill retention barriers to poor documentation and compliance i uh, would like to conclude friends uh, as a science of cpr evolves Uh, we have a tremendous opportunity to improve CPR performance during resuscitation events, both inside and outside the hospital, through better measurement, training, and systems improvement processes of CPR quality. We can have a significant impact on survival from cardiac arrest, and it is only with this that we can fulfill the mission and vision of IRC. That is, every citizen can be a lifesaver, and your two hands can save a life. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Baljit. Uh, there's uh, because of constraints of time, I would require invite the last speaker. And in the meantime, if anybody has questions, please put it in, in the okay. chat box. I've already answered most of the questions, but in case more questions are there, please put it in the chat. Box. Dr. Ashish Devan to talk about how to form a CRTC. Thank you, Dr. Baljit. Can you hear me? I unfortunately I missed out all the scientific lectures in between because I. I start. We started, and I left, and I just returned back to the rest of. Um, uh, I'll not take very long, Dr. Mukul. I reassure you, not more than five seven minutes. Um, no need to introduce myself. I just want to talk about the administrative side of uh, IRCF. Uh, change my slide, um, Samish. Samish. Yeah. Thank you so much. So uh, what I'm going to talk for another five seven minutes is about the CRTC. You must know that is the administrative side of IRCF, uh, and uh, CRTC means Comprehensive Resuscitation Training Center, and this has some responsibilities. This has some role to play. This has uh, 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 some norms to be finished. That's what I'm going to discuss right now, and then. How who can do it and how can we do the CRTC? May I change the slide? Yes, you can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. It's not changing. Yeah. Okay. So basically, CRTC is an independent unit of. Indian Resuscitation Council Federation, and it works also autonomously, but under the guidelines. The BCLS and CCLS courses has to be conducted under CRTC. Rest of the course, like COLS and some other courses, we have been doing without CRTC, but we'll make it in such a way that even the NABH course or the other guidelines which we will add in this also will be doing through the CRTC. Right now, basic cardiac life support and the comprehensive cardiac life support, two courses which you learn today well uh, are being conducted, has to be conducted under CRTC. The CRTC keeps the records of the courses and the students and the way in which we create the batch which is read by the server of the uh, IRCF website, it is so unique that even after 100 years, if you locate that batch, you will be able to Retrieve the number of the students and the faculties connected in that particular course. But the issue is 
every CRTC has to follow all the guidelines and protocols defined and designed by Indian Decision Council Federation. Change the slide. So basically, each CRTC, and there are more than 160 CRTC right now existing across the country, has to have one coordinator. And the coordinator is responsible for the conduct of the courses and all activities under that CRTC. He is whole and soul in charge of the center, and he reports to the national headquarters of IRCF. Change the slide. So there are some role and responsibilities of every CRTC coordinator. He works in coherence with the national headquarter of IRCF and conducts and coordinates IRCF courses, which are defined by IRCF. He enrolls other faculties who are trained under IRCF training of trainers program and certified. He distributes the teaching material to the students acquired from IRCF. Most important, you, you listen wonderful lecture by Dr. Bajit Singh is the maintaining the quality of training. That is the most important responsibility a CRTC coordinator will have because he has to maintain the quality of education and uh, the knowledge and the skills we transfer to the students. And you must understand this situation is a very, very sensitive subject. He also has to maintain the confidentiality of the um, not non-qualified students about the teaching material the IRCF provides to it. It should not be used for any other purpose other than the IRCF courses. And he has to update with the guidelines whenever recommended by the academic directors of IRCF. So these are the responsibilities. And there's some more additional change slide. What he does is whenever he designs, normally what happens, either he generates a course or some hospitals for some reasons like NEBH accreditation or training of the paramedics or staff members or doctors or interns, they invite the people to conduct the course. So there are two types of courses to be organized. Either you generate or you are being invited. And you may have to do in your center, you may have to go to the place where the people you have invited. So first thing, when there's a course is generated, he has to acquire the manuals from IRCF and he has to distribute to the students preferably well in advance, so that when they come for the course, they read the manuals and come. He has to supervise the course proceedings and examination both, and has to update the CRTC website homepage with the student's data. And finally, to the qualified students, he has to deliver the certificates. There's an additional, it's not a job, but it is province to update the blog or the pictures or information on the website, and there is a provision on our website. So who can create a CRTC? An individual trainers or trained instructors or faculty cannot conduct a course unless he affiliates with the CRTC. So the CRTC has to be with an organization. Any medical, dental or nursing college, any hospital, any ISA or any other branch city branches of any other association, any NGO or academic skill labs or organizations which has an infrastructure we are, who are involved in this station training of any international guidelines can join hands and create an ISCF CRTC. But an individual person cannot create a CRTC. What assurance we need is there has to be an infrastructure with the teaching equipment as per the ISC guidelines and that depends on the course we are going to conduct. Suppose you are doing only BCLS, then you need basic uh, CPR mannequins, bag wall mask uh, devices, bag, bag, mouth to mask de uh, barrier devices, and AED. There are minimum requirement for you when you want to conduct the basic cardiopathy life support. But suppose you are planning for a comprehensive cardiopathy life support, then we need advanced mannequins, airway mannequins, we need smaller, smaller stuff like endocrine tubes, zeringoscopes, it is your machine, uh, supraglottic devices and whatnot, as well as arrhythmia generators, defibrillators, defibrillators with uh, synchronizing facility, defibrillators with transcutaneous space packer facility, as well as uh, good ECG monitors. And you need to make at least three sets of this to conduct a comprehensive carbon life support very well. So these are the requirements of our infrastructure. 
And if you do not have such an equipment, no, please keep the same slide. Please keep the same slide. Yeah. Then you need to give an assurance before you plan any course to the chairman of IRC uh, uh, that we can acquire these things, maybe hiring, maybe blend, uh, borrowing from somebody, but the course has norms and has to have certain equipments for conducting the course. And he has to affiliate it, affiliate it, affiliate TOT certified faculties who may be involved in other trainings or maybe only been doing first time with the IRC. So you have to affiliate them and in, involve them in the uh, teaching activities. Now, next slide. So the question comes how to apply for a CRTC. You have to write to the chairman ISCF on NHQ at cprindia.in, that is Dr. Chakrausa's email address, and give the assurance of the infrastructure. You have to sign a memorandum of understanding, which uh, Dr. Chakrausa usually provides, and it has to be signed by the institution. And um, there's a very nominal thing, and there's not a very complicated issue, but this is mandatory requirement. And then he has to provide the details required as asked for, for creating a CRTC, like name of the, the CRTC coordinator, the institution's name, the uh, CRTC name, which you may define anything what you like, then the um, mailing address, email address, uh, phone numbers, which will come on the website. So you have to provide all these things and then the CRTC is created. Next slide. So I, I just finished in five minutes because I know the time constraint is there and I also missed out certain things in between. But I request every one of you, please join IRCF family, be the instructor, join some CRTC and uh, you will be an ambassador of IRC, spreading the dream of Dr. Chakra sir, of having a lifesaver in every house. Thank you so much. Um, you can have the question answers also, administrative questions for this also. You will announce them the next uh, pivot, is there? So, uh, yes, we are doing a next TOT on 23rd of January. This is a Sunday, and it will be a almost six, seven hours program. And uh, propagate this, we will send the link for registration, and uh, we'll uh, conduct a course on 23rd of with all the learned faculties of IRCF. So, uh, th yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ashish. Uh, actually, um, almost all the questions which had come on to the chat box, I have answered. And because of time constraints, there are only two uh, questions which have come up thereafter. And the one is that can code blue be announced when cardiac arrest occurs in an OR? Uh, yes, I would like to say yes, you can uh, announce code blue if cardiac arrest in, occurs in an OR in case help is not available. Normally, adequate help is available in OR, but supposing you are alone or you are involved in some activities which uh, requires uh, personal attention in that and you need help at such a state, uh, you can definitely announce a code. That is the only question I, which I could, I would, uh, apart from this, uh, we would request you all to give your feedbacks in, uh, and so that uh, we come to know whether it was adequate and whether we need to do more for you, more uh, maybe more webinars. That would be great for us. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Chakra Rao and all the panelists today for excellent deliberations. And I would like to thank the Indian College of Anesthesiologists and, uh, and Dr. Radha Krishnan and Sanish for uh, helping us reach out to a large uh, audience. And I hope this will benefit all of them. Uh, there's one last comment which somebody has written that defibrillation must be done uh, with the highest possible uh, highest possible energy uh, energy i know uh, I, I think we have explained it uh, i have explained it in one of the chat answers that no we feel that it can cause myocardial injury so we should not use high energy right in the beginning in case it doesn't work then you increase this thing i would now request dr jashri sood uh, to give a vote of thanks one one word sir yeah, uh, we are conducting a very big survey as uh, dr mukul has told already it will be more than 2 million population we wanted to cover. I request uh, we'll be sending you the things. It is a survey come uh, awareness program we'll be doing. Uh, this type of uh, thing, uh, actually, we have designed it in a very excellent way. 
so I request you to encourage people to participate in the survey. We'll be sending you in different ways, WhatsApps or something like that. And uh, your patients, your, you can keep, if you are working in a corporate hospital, you can keep, um, distribute it. It is only by, through WhatsApp, I think it will come um, by through the patients or something like that. And make it a very big success from all corners of the socio-economical groups and everything. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Jashri, ma'am. Yes. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for this uh, long-awaited webinar, Dr. Chakra Rao. Heartiest congratulations. And thank you for uh, introducing the Indian Resuscitation Council to all the participants and all the viewers on the YouTube as well. Thank you so much. And it was so important for all of us to learn this initiative taken by us in India. And uh, I'm sure we, we, we all, in fact, whenever we get the call from you all to um, do the calls, we all participate. So these are such important uh, aspects for the population. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Chakra. I, I request you to establish one CRTC in uh, Gangaram, madam. Yes, sure. With your guidance, we will definitely do it. Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you, Amukul, Dr. Divan, Rakesh, Dr. Moed, Devetia, and Baljeet for having uh, participated. Uh, and okay. all the lectures, of course, were very pertinent and uh, and we were all benefited. Dr. Paul, somehow I missed. I don't think he was there. Was he there, yes, uh, Rakesh? Yes, he was there, ma'am. Yes, yes. probably that time I got uh, disconnected. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. And uh, uh, I think it will go a long way. It's the beginning, but then we'll be joining you in the survey, of course. Dr. Yes, Dr. Rao, you had mentioned to me earlier. <clears throat> so we will definitely join in that as well. And thank you very much. And we look forward to... You're already to a home. part of us, madam. You're a part yes. of us. <laughs> yes, and, yes, of course. And uh, of course. Request, uh, Sanesh, thank you very much. Uh, for. Uh, right. and so thank you and good night, all of you. And thanks, Sanesh. Thanks a lot. And thank you, everybody. Looking forward to meeting you all again in the next few webinars. Thanks thank a lot. You. Thank, thank you, you so ma'am. Thank, thank you, sir. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.